You're on mute, Ella. Sorry, y'all, that would probably be helpful if I unmuted myself. Um, this is our second public outreach meeting concerning multiple code amendments to the Adams County Development Standards and Regulations, which have been requested by the Board of County Commissioners. Um, and you all didn't hear, but my name is Ella Gleason and I am a planner one with Adams County and I'm joined by a host of other Adams County staff. <clears throat> so last month we introduced you to this process and several concepts and we're excited to share our draft regulations with you this evening. Um, if you have any questions during the meeting, please feel free to drop those in the chat, or if you would prefer, you can email your comments and questions to Layla Bajlan at the email address on the slide. Um, we will be using the polling feature to ask a few questions throughout the presentation, so please participate if you would like, and we will also have an opportunity for Q&A at the end of this presentation. <clears throat> So at a study session with the Board of County Commissioners on May 11th, staff was given the direction to implement the vision of our long range plans by creating zoning overlays for the plan boundaries. Uh, the four plans we are looking to include are the Welby Plan, the Federal Boulevard Framework Plan, the TOD and Rail Station Area Planning Guidelines, and the Clear Creek Valley TOD Plan. We were also given the direction to change the use by right allowances of outdoor storage in the Industrial 2 and Industrial 3 zone districts create a mixed use zone district, <clears throat> add tiny home villages and safe parking regulations as new uses within the county development standards, and finally to empower the comp plan and criteria of approval for land use cases. Uh, many of these efforts are priorities for the Board of County Commissioners and we were actually granted an implementation planner, Carl Onsager, who is with us tonight uh, to help implement all these proposed amendments. So staff will be adding compliance with the comp plan as a criterion of approval to many of our land use cases. Currently, the county is working on advancing Adams, which is an update to the 2012 Imagine Adams comp plan that would provide a vision for development looking into 2040. The adoption of this plan will be in early 2022. Compliance with this document will ensure that development is compliant with the 2040 vision for Adams County. Adding in this criteria also ensures that our long run long range plans are being considered and development is compliant with their specific visions. <clears throat> so next, the county will be pursuing code amendments to change the use by right allowances of outdoor storage in the industrial two and industrial three zone districts. So currently the I2 and I3 zone districts allow for outdoor storage in excess of 100% of the building area uh, by right if it does not exceed 80% of the lot or 10 acres, whichever is less. And if it does exceed that amount, then a conditional use permit is currently required. So staff is re <clears throat> recommending that this 80% threshold should be reduced in the I-2 and I-3 zone districts. Uh, in the I-2 district, outdoor storage would be permitted if it is less than 25% of the entire lot or less than three acres. For I-3 zone districts, outdoor storage would be permitted if it does not exceed 50% of the entire lot or less than six acres. In both zone districts, outdoor storage in excess of 100% of the building area would still be allowed with a conditional use permit. A conditional use permit requires two public hearings. It requires that the use be compatible with the area and the adoption of these regulations. It would require compatibility with the comp plan and applicable sub-area plans and a neighborhood meeting would be required. So we would love to do a poll. Um, to do a quick gut check on these thresholds for outdoor storage. So a poll will appear on your screen um, and we would love for you to tell us whether these uh, new thresholds feel too strict, not strict enough or just right. All right, thank you for participating. Um, so in addition to changing these allowances, uh, we will also be modifying the definition of outdoor storage. So 
As you can see, this is mostly to simplify the definition as it is quite lengthy and confusing. Uh, this new definition also clarifies that any of these things kept outdoors for more than 72 hours is considered outdoor storage. So we're, we are adding um, a temporal element to that definition. Next, we will be adding a mixed use zone district. As Layla mentioned in the last meeting, the creation of a mixed use zone district was called for uh, by the 2012 Imagine Adams Comprehensive Plan and many of our sub area plans. Additionally, the county does not allow for mixed uses by right currently. In 2020, we added mixed use as a use in the development standards that requires a conditional use permit and is only conditionally allowed in our C5 zone district. So this new mixed use zone district will not only allow mixed use by right, but it will also create flexibility in our approach to land uses and enhance the character of Adam County's commercial corridors. Only properties that front an arterial or collector road will be eligible to rezone to the mixed use zone district in order to protect the character of residential neighborhoods. Additionally, there will be reduced setbacks and parking in these zone districts in order to create a more vibrant street front that is welcoming and safe for pedestrians. Many of the standards will mirror the C5 zone district while allowing for a greater variety of uses. A site plan approval will be required and can run concurrently with the rezoning of the property. <clears throat> as we shared last time, we were given direction to pursue the creation of tiny home villages as a use in our development standards. This use would provide flexibility in both building for form and site design requirements for providers of transitional housing for people who are experiencing homelessness or are at risk of being homeless. This use will be allowed with a conditional use permit in residential zone districts. Again, a conditional use permit requires two public hearings that it be compatible with the area and the adoption of these regulations. It would be, uh, it would need to be compatible with the comp plan and other sub area plans and a neighborhood meeting would be required. Currently we are proposing a minimum lot size of half an acre uh, with a density of one home per 2,100 square feet. So that's about 10 homes at minimum. A responsible agent would be required. That is someone to um, both maintain and supervise the site. Parking would be provided, common facilities such as showers, bathrooms and kitchens would be provided. Uh, no outdoor storage would be allowed, but private storage would be provided um, in sheds or garages and the like. So this picture actually shows the uh, beloved tiny home village in Denver, and these are becoming more popular across the country. And so far they have been transformative in helping folks transition to more permanent forms of housing. Uh, so we would like to take a poll. Um, to hear from you as we create these regulations, what do you think will be the most important considerations as we put these together? All right, thank you to those of you who voted. Another use that we will be adding to our development standards under direction of the commissioners is safe parking sites. Uh, we know that many of our houseless neighbors are sheltering in their cars and we want to provide a safe place for them to do so. This use would be regulated to provide safe sites at existing commercial and institutional uses that are compatible with these activities. It would be considered an accessory use to existing institutional and commercial uses and would be permitted through the administrative review process. So this would require a site plan and site management plan from the responsible agent who will be overseeing the site and it will require a community meeting. <clears throat> Currently, we are proposing a minimum lot size of one acre. Uh, parking would be on approved surfaces only. Uh, we would require setbacks to adjacent residential uses to keep an appropriate distance um, from those adjacent uses. Uh, we're proposing 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. as the hours of operation with quiet hours between 10 and 7. And we would ask that hygiene and waste facilities be provided to users of this space. So again, um, we're going to take a poll 
on what you think might be the most important considerations as we regulate safe parking sites. All right, thank you for your feedback. So moving on to overlay districts, uh, as I mentioned, we are adding four new overlay districts, two of which are of interest to the um, federal Clear Creek area. As a reminder, overlay districts are an additional level of requirement to the underlying zone district. So for example, if a property is zoned I-1 and is within the federal boulevard sub area, it would be subject to both the I-1 zoning and the regulations of the federal boulevard overlay. So if there are more than one overlays present, they would all apply. Um, and so overlays help to apply specific standards to an area. And in this case, we'll provide the opportunity for incentives and we'll guide development that is in line with our sub area plans. Um, and again, these overlays are not countywide. They're just specific to the plan area. So the federal boulevard framework overlay is recommended by staff in order to implement the 2014 Federal Boulevard Framework Plan. Uh, the plan and overlay area is roughly 2.25 miles along Federal with 72nd to the north, Zuni to the east, 52nd to the south, and Lowell to the west. Uh, the framework plan recognized the need for more thoughtful planning as two new RTD stations were built along the Federal Corridor. Additionally, Adams County is working with the cities of Westminster and Federal Heights to conduct a mobility study along Federal Boulevard to increase pedestrian activity. Goals within this plan include mixed use development and higher density residential along Federal. So first we are proposing many different standards that would improve the pedestrian environment. Uh, creating a sense of place will be a priority. We will require enhanced landscaping and open space between sidewalks and buildings. Uh, standards will require commercial and multifamily buildings to face adjacent streets, connecting walkways, parks, or similar outdoor spaces. Uh, if the building is adjacent to Federal Boulevard, then there must be an entrance on Federal. No off-street parking will be permitted between the street and the front or side of the building in order to provide a safer pedestrian environment without cars moving through that space. Lastly, building fronts along Federal Boulevard must incorporate more typical commercial shop front dimensions to cre create more active uses. Staff is also proposing several design standards for buildings along Federal that would create more of a cohesive sense of place and improve the pedestrian experience. This is a list of criteria that will work together to create storefronts that are interesting and inviting. Articulation refers to the way we make different parts of the building stand out. So, in this picture, you can see that the building has an identifi identifiable base, body, and top. Uh, colors will be limited to two primary and two secondary, and transparent active storefronts will be required as is feasible to create an inviting atmosphere. Additional landscape buffer requirements would apply to new commercial uses when they are constructed adjacent to an existing residential or agricultural use in the Federal Boulevard overlay. Currently, new commercial uses are required to have a buffer yard C, which is a 15 foot minimum buffer yard with two trees per 80 linear feet of lot line and a fence. Uh, staff is proposing to add five feet of additional buffer yard and two additional trees per 80 feet of lot line. Uh, Federal Boulevard is currently home to a wide range of uses, and this modification would provide for greater buffering between more intense uses such as commercial and less intense uses such as residential. Uh, lastly, we are proposing to amend the use table uh, within the Federal Boulevard overlay. So these 
uses will no longer be allowed as a use by right because they are inconsistent with the vision and character of a mixed use neighborhood. Uh, this does not mean that we will be discontinuing the current uses that are here. Um, this is only for new uses um, that would be looking to be permitted along Federal Boulevard. So um, we would love to take another poll and hear uh, specifically about the Federal Boulevard overlay uh, district, whether um, what you think might be important, uh, what considerations as we uh, put these regulations together. All right, thank you for your feedback. Uh, so next we're going over the TOD overlay. Staff is recommending a new TOD overlay to implement both the TOD and rail station planning guidelines and the Clear Creek Valley TOD plan. Uh, these plans were adopted in 2007 and 2009 respectively and provide guidance for planning considerations for our six station areas within and near unincorporated Adams County. We know that development typically follows when transit is introduced to an area and our intent is to implement the standards we have already adopted through an overlay district. Uh, for those of you that may not know, TOD stands for Transit Oriented Development. It is a planning approach that calls for high density, mixed use business residential neighborhood centers to be clustered around transit stations and corridors. So here you can see the location of each of our six transit stations in and near unincorporated Adams County. Uh, this overlay would only apply to properties that are within a half mile distance from each transit station. So these are highlighted by the buffer on the map. It's that uh, dark blue circle around each um, transit station. This chart shows the zoning characteristics of the properties within unincorporated Adams County that also fall within that half mile station buffer area. As you can see, the majority of holdings within station areas are zoned residential and PUD. And there's also a significant amount of industrial zoned land as far as land area goes. So previously we adopted a TOD zone district. Um, however, no properties have rezoned to TOD so far. The TOD overlay implements many similar standards as you can see on this chart. Um, however, we wanna be clear that this is not a rezoning to TOD. Properties will maintain their zoning in addition to these TOD overlay standards. There are a few differences to note. Um, outdoor storage would still be allowed and increased height or density would only be allowed through an incentives program with the county. So we're gonna take one last poll uh, pertaining, to the, pertaining to the TOD overlay and we'd love to know uh, your thoughts on what we should be considering. And that acronym TOTO is Transit Oriented Development Overlay. So Ella, while you're here, um, we do have a question. I think it might be helpful. Um, I maybe have one of our economic development team uh, chime in here, but um, can someone speak to the potential for uh, density or incentives that we might be looking at for the transit oriented development area? Uh, maybe Ryan or Max or Jenny. Um, 
I could go ahead and hop in here unless Jenny, you wanted to take that. Why don't you take a first stab at it, Max, and I'll, I'll gladly add on. All right, perfect. Um, a couple of things. Uh, we've, we've had the conversations moving forward in, in regards to height incentives for density around our TOD stations. Um, as part of our economic development plan, we're trying to uh, solidify an incentive structure for that type uh, for those types of uh, activities, as well with the recent bill. I can't remember the bill number on the top of my head right now, um, where the state had uh, helped allow additional incentive programs for uh, certain types of housing development. We're actually currently uh, going through the process of kind of a needs assessment to see what we need specifically and how do we make that, uh, how do we build a program that works for what we're trying to accomplish in the future, as well as works for what's needed by our community. Sure, so I'll just add on too. Um, you know, the menu of, of incentives that the county can offer is, looks a little bit different than what some of the cities with TOD stations are able to do. I think we're happy to look at density bonuses and, and height increases. However, um, outside of Denver and in the more heavily populated areas, we haven't seen a whole lot of um, developers taking advantage of, of those density bonuses. So we can include it, but I think we're going to be effective. We're probably going to have to look at some other um, ways to encourage that type of development. I'm just sorry, since now. Yep, no, we can answer some more uh, questions at the end. I just wanted to have that, have you guys jump in there since we were on the topic. So I'll, I'll end the polling, um, then we can get back to the presentation. And if you guys have questions, if you go along, if you can put them in the chat, we'll get to them um, once the presentation's over. Thanks. All right, thanks, Jenny and Max. Um, <clears throat> that is, uh, that concludes our overview of the draft amendments. Uh, we will have physical copies of these drafts on our website in early August. Um, you will be able to access them on the link provided here. And we'll also drop that in the chat. Um, once we have received and incorporated public comments, uh, we will host a study session with the Board of County Commissioners in late August. That is open to the public. Uh, then we will send these drafts to all relevant referral agencies for comment. Uh, tentatively, these drafts will go before the Planning Commission in October and to the Board of County Commissioners in November. Uh, we encourage you to stay involved in this process and continue to provide your feedback. Uh, you can provide comments, questions, or concerns to Layla at the email address provided here. Um, if you're interested in overlays being proposed in other parts of the county, you can join us uh, for our countywide update meeting this Thursday, July 29th. It will also be on Zoom at 6 p.m. Uh, yeah, so thank you again for joining us tonight, and we will take some time to answer some other questions. Okay, so I can moderate the questions if you guys don't mind. Um, let's see if I can get my video to work. All right. Um, let's see, so we talked about incentives. Uh, the next question relates to, um, so the question says, since we're discussing tiny home villages and parking for houseless persons to live in their cars, I'm concerned about the high cost of housing at the proposed and fill TOD development. Is an effort being made to preserve affordable housing in these TODs? And I will turn that over to Jenny. She volunteered to take this question. Um, and again, if you guys have questions, um, please put them in the chat or raise your hand using the raise hand feature and I can call on you. Sure, I will, <clears throat> I will start and Max, feel free to add on some more. Um, so, so for those of you who don't know me, this was actually the work that I did for Westminster for the last five years. Um, and so I'll build from that, that perspective. I think one of the most important things that we do um, at, the, at the planning level um, around TODs is to try and create the framework that allows our, our partners, our development partners to, to do exactly what we want them to do. So as it relates to preserving the affordable housing, we're largely trying to create environments that don't drive um, existing development out in a way that then displaces people. Um, fortunately, we have a really outstanding um, set of housing authorities in Adams County that make for very effective partners. 
um, and we will try to continue to work with them on opportunities in those areas. That's been very effective at Westminster Station, but there are certainly others. Um, and also one of the things that, that tends to help with development of new affordable housing is looking very thoughtfully at the parking requirements. Um, we know that being in a TOD area generally can bring down the required amount of parking. We also can, can do a little bit closer look at what the utilization rate is around affordable housing um, properties in, in TOD proximity. So Max, do you have anything else you'd like to, to add on to that too? Really not a ton to add on to that, Jenny. You covered it really well, just to really reiterate what Jenny was saying. Um, we understand, you know, some uh, sometimes when you engage too strong on uh, mandating things like affordable housing, it'll drive up the cost of regular housing. And then you have that massive uh, loss of the missing middle housing. So really when we're going through this process, we're trying to be as cognizant as possible to make sure that uh, market rate attainable housing is available to our community and not just trying to, uh, you know, drive one side or the other up or down. We're trying to, <laughs> we're trying to make sure that the housing availability is there really. Right. And, and I think, you know, just to, uh, to finish that point, what we really want to look for in any of the neighborhoods, but especially in TODs that are highly desirable places is that there's really a spectrum of housing opportunities for all income levels and, and people that are desiring a variety of unit types. <clears throat> Certainly we're not doing single family housing um, so much in, in that proximity as trying to encourage greater density, but we do wanna see everything from studio units up to, to three and four bedrooms that can accommodate families so that there's a range of options. Awesome, thanks guys. Um, so I'm gonna go down the list in terms of questions. So I know you guys are putting questions in. We've got a bunch, uh, bunch here. So. Uh, the next one is how can we obtain copies of your slides and polling results? Um, so we'll be posting these presentations on our website. I'll post that website in the chat here in a minute when I have a quick minute, unless someone else can get to it before me. I'm looking at you, Layla, <laughs> if you want to post the regulation on the website. Um, polling results, I think are going to be a little bit more difficult just because um, we're using the same webinar for four different meetings. Um, so I think the results get um, wiped every time I do it, but I know Layla um, has been writing down those. So we'll try to figure out a way to share those, uh, maybe in a spreadsheet or something. So we'll, we'll try to figure out a way to get those polling results to you all. Um, can we define the uh, federal boulevard uh, boundaries for the overlay? I think Layla have, has those memorized. So I'm gonna turn that over to Layla for the boundaries of the federal boulevard overlay. Yeah, so the boundaries for the Federal Boulevard Framework Plan are from 52nd to the south and then uh, 72nd to the north. And then the east-west boundaries are Lowell Boulevard and Brunei Street. So it's everything in, in between. Thank you. Um, and this one might be uh, something that Paulo can help address, um, but I can take a stab. So would there be requirements for mental health assistance, job finding assistance um, with, the, with the tiny home village and safe parking initiatives? I think that's something that we would like to see. Um, I'm not sure how far we want to go within our regulations. The county doesn't often regulate those types of things, but I know that's something that we'd want to see um, being provided. Um, so I know Paulo said that he may not be available for this point in time. We can jump back to that question um, in a little bit, but I, I think at this, at this moment, we weren't uh, looking to regulate that specifically, um, but that might be a component of, um, of what the commissioners might be looking at if they're, because um, the tiny home village uh, use would have to go to a public hearing before the commissioners. And so that's something that they could evaluate at that time as well. All right, so this one says uh, affordable housing. So, so I guess, Jenny, um, how would you define affordable housing in this scenario? Yes, so um, we typically like to keep definitions consistent so that there's no confusion across programs. Um, we typically refer to affordable as up to 80% of area median income because we know that's where the federal programs end. 
And then um, while we haven't done it yet, I think we will look at um, articulating workforce housing as being something in that 80 to 120 percent AMI range. Um, it gets it gets a little bit messy in our work with developers to create definitions that don't line up with the federal um, AMI tables, um, particularly as it relates to providing any sort of incentives. Um, so I think we will we will look to keep that consistent, but it is an area that we need to update and better define um, through our through our work. All right. Uh, next question, will the county be implementing condemnation to acquire land for TOD? Uh, certainly not. The, can the county does not want to take your land or buy land for anything related to transit oriented development. Um, this is just uh, a zoning overlay to uh, get development to the place where it was envisioned by the approved uh, and adopted uh, plans that the commissioners um, considered uh, years ago. So this is just an effort to um, moving forward, any new development would have to comply um, with those zoning overlays. Has nothing to do with, with county ownership um, or anything like that, which kind of goes uh, into the next question. Um, are we going to grandfather, are we gonna be able to grandfather our existing properties for items like sidewalks, front driveways, et cetera? Uh, for sure, yeah, so, so we're not looking to change any um, anything that is currently existing, but if there is going to be a new use on a property, we're going to need it to conform to the new regulation. So um, any, any uses that are currently in existence um, that were permitted by the county, um, we aren't going to be requesting or requiring any kind of changes to that. And then Layla put that uh, link into the chat. Let's see. The level of detail in Westminster's specific area plan for Westminster Station is very helpful. Will you have a similar approach for development guidelines in the unincorporated half mile area for that station? Good question. So we actually have six different stations that have uh, unincorporated area in their half mile buffer. So um, we actually have some guidance for both the federal and Pecos stations, but the other stations were not considered at the time of that plan. They are um, included in a general transit-oriented development planning and guideline, um, I guess, uh, sub-area plan that was adopted by the commissioners, but um, nothing specific for the other stations besides federal and PACO. So um, I think that our current approach is going to be um, implementing an overlay that would be applicable to all of those uh, six areas, but then uh, maybe for a phase two, look at do, doing a more specific uh, tailored approach for each station area because they all have their own character. Um, it's just a little bit more than I think we're able to tackle in this period of time that we have um, that the commissioners gave us. So um, that's certainly something we want to do, um, just probably will not happen at this point in time. Um, we are a trucking company where trucks are gone in the day and parked at night. Are we considered outdoor storage? Good question. Um, I'm going to test one of our planners to tackle that one. Um, Layla, would you would you take that question? So, what is considered outdoor storage specific to vehicle parking? So, for vehicle parking right now, it's anything that sits for more than 72 hours, um, and that would include trucks. Um, and any anything stored outdoors for more than 72 hours for sale, lease, um, including trucking. We are looking to change the definition of outdoor storage. So um, that will change with these regulation amendments as well. All right, thank you. Um, and so, yes, uh, the next question is, would a new site plan on a quote, grandfathered use also triggered trigger the new requirements? Um, I think that we'd have to look at the um, uh, non-conforming regulations that we have. So there's a certain um, point in time when a use uh, becomes no longer non-conforming, um, and that would that would then trigger the new requirements. So or uh, legal non-conforming. So um, if an expansion of the use might trigger something like that. So I think we'd have to decide that on a case by case basis. 
And then if the county is not going to use condemnation, how are developers going to acquire land for TOD? Um, that's a private transaction. Uh, the county's not gonna be involved um, in the sale or purchase of transit-oriented development uh, properties. Um, that's just something we're, we're regulating the uses and the development of the property, but we're not regulating um, what exactly is gonna go on it in terms of, you know, that's, uh, that's our economic development team that would help for uh, helping, helping folks with that process. Um, so yeah, definitely, I don't know if Max wants to jump in on that one. <laughs> I'm sorry, Jen, can you repeat the question? I was responding back to an email. Sorry, paternity leave, getting ready for that. So trying to multitask here. Um, so I guess maybe just help explain uh, if the county's not going to condemn land for transit-oriented development, uh, how do developers acquire that land? How do developers acquire that land for transit-oriented development? Um, we would hope under the proper conditions that uh, with the development of our of these overlays that we're going through, we would really create an environment that is uh, attractive to certain types of economic development projects that we're trying to see here throughout the county. We believe wholeheartedly in a carrot approach, by no means a stick approach, especially in a development such as this, as this where we want to see development that meets the needs of our community, especially as we're moving forward to uh, to really encapsulate our, our TOD development and really define what kind of uses we're trying to see there. And like I, like I mentioned before, we're hoping that that could help build a, an, an environment that is conducive to developers wanting to come in, acquire properties and uh, uh, develop towards the ending land use goals of the county. And that, that's why we're here, like Jen mentioned earlier, we're here to help developers go through our processes as well as property owners who are looking to develop towards a long-term future, go through our processes and really hold your hand as best we can and help guide you through that process. So uh, not only do you, the uh, property owner, get to see a benefit from their project, but where the citizens of Adams County also get to see that benefit as well. So we're really trying to be here to help you and uh, whatever we can do to help you out, we'd, lo we'd love to engage in conversations. I'd just like to add on to that <clears throat> for a moment because we're really talking about areas of density. And it's important to go back and reiterate something Jen um, described earlier, which is that the county does not control water and sewer. So this is a conversation about the zoning and, um, and providing guidance through the process, through the entitlement process. But it needs to be clear for developers that we can't provide all of the answers. So um, making sure that there are sufficient utilities to serve um, sites to, to meet the developer's goals as well is a really important part of that process and certainly something we would want to provide some direction and, and guidance on. All right, I'm going to take a pause in the questions. We've got Paulo back here. Um, so I think, Paulo, if, if you could help answer the question as to um, how far the county would want to go in requiring services for tiny home villages and safe parking, or if that's something um, that maybe your team can help work with providers on? Yeah, that's a great question. And sorry, we have to jump back to it. Uh, I had to step away for a little bit. Um, so with regards to tiny homes and safe parking, one of the things that we've learned is uh, an important aspect of the program is making sure that those wraparound services are available. I think the models that we've looked at, whether it's in Austin, Texas, or whether it's out there in Portland or Albuquerque, um, that's a key component in making sure that uh, individuals who live in these tiny home communities or um, are staying in a safe parking community um, does have those services that can help them transition into uh, the next level of housing. Um, so for example, the one in Denver, I know that they have uh, uh, mental health professionals, they have health services that come uh, to the site on, uh, I think, a, at least a weekly basis, but sometimes daily service, daily basis. Um, they also try to make sure that mobile showers are available, mobile laundry, and just making sure that um, there's job developers who come out there from Bayad who comes out to the Denver site. And we know that these are the key components of that program. Um, so from the safe parking site, that's really what makes it different than say parking at a Walmart um, after 9 p.m. Uh, we try to make sure that the programs that are running uh, do have uh, security, there's a check-in available, uh, making sure that there are bathrooms available uh, to make sure that it really is a safe place for them to stay. Um, and being able to be connected to a nonprofit organization that can help um, 
direct them to other services. Now, uh, me and my team, we are able to uh, help out a nonprofit organization who's looking to run that type of business um, and, and to connecting them into those services and identifying who those partners are. They can make sure that it's a program that becomes very successful. Jen, did that answer the question based off of uh, what you had seen earlier? Yeah, I think so. Um, I do, yep. see yeah, I think we're good. I'll, I'll let you know if we get any more. Okay, perfect. And thanks, Jennifer, for that comment. All right, we're going to jump back to outdoor storage. Um, so to confirm, outdoor storage de is defined uh, as vehicles or other uh other items that are stored longer than 72 hours without moving. So um, if that's like, if the truck is parked in a lot for more than 72 hours and does not move at all during that 72 hour time span, we would consider that outdoor storage. Um, if you're moving that, you know, back and forth and you're using that uh, during the day, um, you know, and then it's parked there at night, that's, that's something that we would not consider as outdoor storage. Uh, and then, yes, we are looking at changing the definition of outdoor storage. I did try in the last um, meeting in June to read our definition of outdoor storage live on the air, and it was kind of a disaster. So um, we are looking at refining that, um, just making it more clear. Right now, it's it's not clear. We're not we're not planning on changing that 72 hour rule, um, or really the intent behind outdoor storage definition. We're just trying to make it more clear to people. Um, what it means. We have addition of, a definition of storage. Um, so I think that maybe changing that definition and just adding outdoor um, it might be what we're looking at. I haven't been um, in the loop on that one. So I don't know, Ella, do you have any update on that? No, I mean, you said it. Uh, if we basically took that out, the definition of storage and put outdoor um, yeah, to broadly mean any materials that are left outdoors for a 72 hour continuous period. Um, so it's just a little bit more clear. Thank you. Um, and then back to Jenny, Max or Ryan, our economic development team, will there be tax incentives for the types of development that we're trying to encourage? Hi everybody, uh, Max again. Uh, economic development manager. So right now we're going through the process as this overlay process is going on as well. We are uh, working on our economic development plan and implementation strategy. And as part of that, we will be identifying mechanisms in which uh, we can utilize to help uh, uh, provide that carrot, like I said earlier, to bring about development that meets the, uh, the end goals of the county and the needs of the community. Um, I can't give any word on what that's going to look like right now. Uh, county powers, as some of you might be aware, are different from cities as well in terms of the things we can incentivize and how we can incentivize it. Um, but we are absolutely, those are the types of things we are looking at to try to figure out how do we uh, help uh, shepherd along and incentivize that certain type of development going on throughout the county. And I would add to that, um, that we're also looking at things where it may not be directly the county's tax base that we're looking. So business improvement districts and others you know, if the business community actually wanted to come together and create, you know, sort of the ecosystem that they're looking at, you know, the county would always be interested in having those conversations as well. So both stuff, we directly have control on the tax base side, property tax rebates and others, but also kind of trying to work with the business communities and developers in the area to kind of get to the objectives that we're looking at at the end. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Um, I think that's the end of the questions in the chat. So we're, we're here for another 10 minutes. Um, we do have another, our last meeting of the evening uh, starting at 7 p.m. So we'll have to for sure end by then. I'm sure other people will be joining as well. Uh, same time, same place, or next, new time, same place. Um, so another question that we have, um, some land along Lowell Boulevard is zoned R2. Will the county be changing residential zoning. So I think um, I answered this question in, in the last meeting as well, um, but we're not changing the underlying zone district. We're not changing um, what is going to be permitted um, in terms of density um, right off the bat. I think that's something that we uh, might consider, but at this point in time, we're not changing uh, the zone district. We're just looking at adding um, some incentives, um, some design standard guidelines, some uh, restricting of 
uh, outdoor storage and things like that, we're not changing the underlying zone district. All right, well, we're going to take a 10 minute break before our next meeting. Um, so I'm going to end, end this uh, recording. Um, we really appreciate you all attending and providing feedback. Um, we're going to present, uh, we're going to put our presentations, uh, the PowerPoint, the recording, and hopefully our poll results online. So um, that link that Layla shared earlier, um, you can go there. Uh, we'll be posting our drafts uh, later this week or early next week. Um, at the latest, so keep an eye out for that. Um, and if you are interested, uh, you can um, put your email address in the chat and we will um, add you to a mailing list. Um, yeah, thank you all for attending and um, we will be in touch.